Hello, and welcome to this DC Velocity pod webcast. Uh, prescriptive warehousing, how technology enables execution in complex DCs. I'm Ben Ames, senior news editor at DC Velocity. Thanks for joining us. Running a Fortune 500 supply chain is hard. For the third party logistics provider, United Facilities, who have over 8 million square feet under management and enable multiple Fortune 500 companies to maximize their supply chain performance across North America. Labor is scarce and business demands are more complex than ever. As they help their major customers grow to capacity, ensuring that their warehouse operations are streamlined is critical. So in this webinar, experts from autoscheduler.ai and from United Facilities will cover four approaches for helping customers grow capacity by ensuring that warehouse operations are streamlined. They will describe digital strategy and analytics, how to orchestrate siloed functional disciplines, getting more out of headcount through a balance of process and technology, and advancing new technologies in the distribution center. We have just a few announcements before we begin. First, here are some tips to help you connect and participate in the webcast. This webcast is designed to be interactive between you and our presenters. Uh, later in the program, we'll have a question and answer session to allow you to ask our presenters questions that are relevant to the topics we'll be discussing in a minute. You can participate in the Q&A session by asking questions at any time during the podcast. You don't have to wait until the end to get your question to us. Just type your question into the text box located at the bottom left of the console, and then click the Submit Question button. We'll get to as many questions during our presentation as we can. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. If those slides are not advancing, please press your F5 key or Control R on your keyboard uh, to refresh your console. We recommend also that you disable your pop-up blockers. And if you're experiencing any technical problems, please visit our webcast help guide by clicking on the help link below the media player. Now let's get on with our program. Allow me to introduce today's presenters, Keith Moore and Brian Bradley. Keith is the chief product officer for autoscheduler.ai and Brian is a solutions manager for United Facilities. Welcome gentlemen. I will now turn the stage over to Brian, who will begin today's presentation. Over to you, Brian. Thank you. Uh, so just a little bit about United Facilities. So it's an end-to-end -end supply chain solutions company um, offering warehousing and fulfillment services that is based in Peoria, Illinois. Um, we work with some large consumer food uh, corporations that I'm sure all of you have in your kitchen right now, as well as some large agriculture and other smaller customers. Um, as it was mentioned earlier, roughly 8 million square feet under ownership or management um, and 600 employees in multiple states. In addition to the warehousing fulfillment services, we offer packaging services, um, value added packaging services that also uh, work for the building store displays and, and opportunities such as this, um, transportation services, um, expansion into uh, being able to provide information technology support to our customers as well and then overall value added logistics. And I'll do a quick introduction to myself as well. So my name is Keith Moore. I'm the chief product officer for Auto Scheduler AI. Um, I have been working in the supply chain space uh, for about four years now, primarily focused on logistics and distribution center management. Uh, Auto Scheduler, the company, is a fairly new organization. Um, we just launched in August of 2020. So if you haven't heard of us, that might be why we're a little bit over a year old. Um, but we have been really fortunate in that we work with top 100 consumer goods companies. Uh, so we were uh, launched and kind of do a lot of work with our, our biggest client, Procter & Gamble, uh, as well as numerous other companies and, and work with Brian and his team with uh, some of our mutual customers. Uh, what Auto Scheduler is, is just for a quick kind of brief for everybody, is we are focused on orchestrating and optimizing all of the different activities that need to occur inside of a distribution center. So um, we sit on top of warehouse management systems, provide all of that algorithmic optimization to figure out who needs to be doing what task when, so that you're reducing touches, maximizing cross docking. You know, if you're at a production site, you're line loading more. If you have a site with multiple buildings, you're minimizing transportation between those buildings. And in the end, you're getting more capacity out of your headcount. So that's us at Auto Scheduler. Great, thank you, Brian and Keith. Uh, 
sounds like but you have a whole lot of uh, experience there and knowledge that we have to share. So let's uh, get into some of the details of our discussion agenda here. Um, we have three main points to help organize our talk. Uh, first, uh, let's, we're going to work our way through some of the process challenges that are faced today, uh, particularly prioritizing the challenges in a distribution center. Uh, point two is building a digital strategy in the warehouse to try to address those. And point three is a roadmap to achieve uh, sort of the holy grail here, which is dark planning. Uh, so let's get into it. So maybe, maybe I'll kick off and, and just as far as the challenges that we're actually facing inside of um, distribution center. So I mentioned, you know, I haven't been in the logistics and supply chain space for um, decades and decades, which I, you know, I work with a lot of, uh, I'd call them salty year, you know, 30, 40 year, 30, 40 year veterans um, in warehousing. And, and so a lot of the technology is fairly, I won't say new to me, but how it's set up is really interesting. So coming from, I've done a lot of historical work in aerospace, you know, financial services, um, automotive, utilities, oil and gas. Uh, and really around building software and using um, machine learning slash uh, artificial intelligence, air quotes. And so the first thing I noticed when I came in to work in uh, distribution centers is just how diverse the software landscape is and the general lack of communication. So, um, and really we're talking about if I'm a, a director or a VP of IT or logistics, and I look at my software ecosystem, you know, for every single site, I have a, maybe a warehouse management system and then potentially a different yard management system with some EDI in between, a, in between them. And then I have a production plant that might be four hours away that's running SAP or some other software um, that's not integrated with my warehouse management system or my yard management system. And I'm planning stock transfer orders between SAP with some transportation management system. And I'm using that for actually booking freight but I get real-time updates on that freight from a Project 44 or a Four Kites. And so you have all of these different systems with, we'll call them minimum to some level of integration. And there's a lot of good EDI processes that different customers have developed. And we can go into that a little bit later on if there are any questions on it. But um, you, you end up with people that are responsible for running operations at the site. You know, I, I think of my um, GSD club, which is my get done club. Um, I'm trying to uh, keep the swearing to a minimum here. You know, at the site, people have to get the work done. And when you have all of these different platforms with different screens that you're looking at, it becomes a huge challenge to actually orchestrate and optimize all these different activities. And so that's kind of what our whole business is built on. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but from a, you know, just from a software landscape perspective, it seems uh, really, really challenging to kind of operate in, particularly when People working, you know, planning in a warehouse, they have 100 fires to put out at any point in time. They don't have time to figure out how to consolidate all these different systems. Yeah, that, and absolutely, that that really rings true with what I hear uh, when, when I talk to folks in the industry. I mean, um, you know, that, that it goes from the most prosaic problems in that area, like uh, sometimes the, the data field for the same type of information has a different name in, in mm -hmm. each of those different uh, software platforms you're talking about. Um, and, and then it gets to a you know, much more foundational problem, like do they even share a single source of truth? Yeah. I know. <clears throat> yeah, Brian, I don't know. It might be useful if you, you can talk through some of the, like you know, your boots on the ground, you have a whole team focused on this. What are some of like the more practical non-software related challenges that you guys are facing? Well, I think everybody right now, no matter what the industry is, is facing some challenge with the uh, labor availability and, and overall quality of the labor uh, when you do find it. So that is one of the things that I think that we're all facing. Um, but some things that are more applicable to the operations that, that I'm involved with is we really struggle with lack of real-time measurements, unlike production facilities that have quality control standards at every single point and real-time data so that they can make an immediate adjustment. We end up having conversations the day after uh, with our customers as to how things went, what KPIs were met, any challenges that we faced. And so you're looking at a 24-hour window where you're trying to have to make some assessments as to what went wrong and when the corpus correction should have happened versus when it did. Um, so it's constantly reactionary. There's a push to try to be a more planning-centric um, operation, but right now we're still reactionary in the most cases uh, in the 3PL world. 
And then capacity issues uh, are a big struggle. We, we spoke a little bit about labor there, but transportation, I think we've all felt the pain of that, whether that you're actually in the industry or you're just a consumer at the grocery store or, or any other kind of store for that matter, just being able to find the availability of the products that you're looking for. Um, and then the customer behavior as well. So we're supplying goods that eventually end up on the store shelves for our customers. And as a result, that behavior has changed over the course of the last 10 years, but specifically the last couple of years with COVID, it has become even more challenging, causing the need for labor to be exacerbated even more. And the need that we see, that the position that we need to find ourselves in is to be that provider of choice, to make sure that we are the competitive labor market, we are the provider of choice, the place that the employee wants to come to, that transportation wants to schedule and give beneficial freight terms, uh, as well as uh, positioning ourselves in the market to be able to expand the business um, for other customers and provide service. Yeah, for sure. And then we, we've all heard a whole lot about the impact of COVID on that kind of thing. Uh, obviously, there's been a e-commerce surge uh, with, with people living and working from home and, uh, and and not getting out into stores as much. But I think we're all seeing, even as you know, restrictions uh, touch wood keep loosening here. Um, you know, a lot of those new behaviors are uh, seems like they're baked in and they're going to uh, really last for the long term. Uh, it, it's, it's not out of the woods uh, yet. It's really going to make some permanent changes in how DCs operate. Uh, all right. Well, uh, let's move into our next section. Um, you know, looking at those, those are some some uh, some large challenges, uh, no doubt. But uh, we have to talk about building a digital strategy um, to try to get some traction as we you know begin that journey ahead of us. Uh, Brian, can you head us down that road? Sure. <clears throat> so. One of the challenges that we face, and I know that Keith spoke to it, is, is trying to manage data flow from multiple different systems within the operation and then different areas within the operation itself. Um, so that is one of the things that we were looking forward to the opportunity with working with Auto Scheduler in more depth with, um, because we're, as the 3PL, we're managing in our WIM system, which then EDIs to a production management system at our customer. Um, there are proprietary things that we've designed over the years to try to manage lot management, carrier uh, communications, all of those things. And, and unfortunately, still, there's a lot of it that um, is acquired and managed through spreadsheets. Um, what we also find is that there's not a one fit, one stop shopping for, for these type of solutions. Um, and we need to find something that's user friendly for all of the aspects um, and the end users. The thing that we're seeing now is that the customers are wanting to get more involved in the day to day operational aspects and understand uh, how the business works to a greater degree than they ever have before. So we spend a lot of time trying to put together um, data points into graphs, charts, presentations, um, sometimes uh, almost to the point of paralysis by analysis to try to get improvement built into the operations. And so that's one of the things that as we look at the opportunities that, that Keith will speak more of later, that's where I think there's a real benefit for all operations. And maybe maybe to jump in, right? I, I think you, you mentioned earlier that get you know at least getting the data and not being um responsive so so instead of having to be reactionary being a little bit ahead of it um and, and one of the challenges slash opportunities you you have as a 3pl is right you don't manage or own all of the data that you have to operate on top of and so you know you met you mentioned your your warehouse management system um aren't you guys using some other technologies as well to kind of help consolidate some of that data into one place Yes, we are. We've had to reach out over the the last few years to try to find solutions to provide some analytic support, um, some tools that were, that are out there to allow us to be able to not have to do it manually. I mean, there's it's great if you're someone who is analytics driven and minded to start with, but we are the people who are getting it done. To to your point earlier. Um, that's not necessarily where the strength of a lot of 3PL operations are is in the data collection and analytics. Um, we 
we're good at reporting data that we find um, throughout the processes and, and following processes, but but really that analytics piece is something that's missing and that's something that, that we've had to look externally with, with a company. Um, Rebus has helped us with some of that as far as the analytics aspect um, and the dashboards uh, for us and our customers to have some visibility real time. Perfect. Well, maybe um, what I can do then is, in, in particular, when I, I have this conversation with a lot of folks, right, we're, we're kind of talking the theory of what, you know, how do I get to dark planning? Because, you know, anytime you talk with a, a VP or a director, they immediately mention it. Um, and so we can, we can talk about what, you know, why can't I just get this out of my warehouse management system? And it's something I don't really see a lot of folks talk about is like, what is a warehouse management system good at and what is it not good at? Because almost every site that, um, at least most big consumer goods sites, most sites that are shipping full truckload, um, really, I mean, most sites that are shipping e-com and, and parcel as well, have warehouse management systems in place to try to run the operation. And they are really good at certain functions and they should be used for certain functions. Those, those companies, you know, the big ones, the Corbers, the um, Blue Yonders, the SAPs, they've built a very robust tool set that's good at managing inventory, managing inventory age, managing space, understanding who's where, some of the work around interleaving that these companies have been doing lately or, you know, waiving work and task management and actually getting into the execution of how can you take the space and inventory you have and have that interact with the people you have so that you're actually tasking work out effectively, a lot of that work is really good. Um, and there's a, a whole ecosystem of software and hardware solutions built around the warehouse management system. But it doesn't do everything, right? And, and this is one of the biggest challenges I, you know, we have when we're going in and educating the market is what is it bad at? And it is really bad at actually optimizing processes together. The reality at most sites, if you're, you're shipping full truckload, is you have a set group of people for both receiving and shipping. And so you need to be able to balance your inbounds versus your outbounds. And I have you know, some customers, and they're like, we operate on modes. So we have a lot of outbound that day. We're going to prioritize outbound, and we'll ignore inbounds. We start to have a lull in operations. We're going to bring in inbounds, and we have to shift from mode one to mode two so that we know what we should be prioritizing because we only, you know, there's a constraint, right? You only have so many people. You only have so much staging space, so many doors that you can operate in, so much space for inventory to bring in. And when you start to get into these different types of, um, I call them like functional silos inside of a building. So how do you balance receiving with shipping, with cuts management on inventory and labor management on who should be doing what and how you prioritize, you know, uh, what the work queue needs to look like based on who's in what zone and the work required in each zone and, and the best way to actually kind of interleave all of that and chain tasks together, that's where warehouse management systems are just not as an analytically driven to do that. And the, the easiest example I have is um, almost every customer I go to, I say, great, how do you decide what trailer to load next? It's a really simple question with a lot of really interesting answers. And <laughs> the most common answer is, well, our warehouse management system looks and it says, here is the earliest ship date or appointment time for that outbound shipment. And whatever the next one is that we haven't started loading, that's what we do next. So then I ask the next question. I say, okay, that makes sense. And that generally is going to work. What if you don't have the inventory for it? Oh, well, then we're going to go and look at receiving and I'm going to call my receiving manager and see if there's a hot load we can prioritize to bring in to actually take that inventory into the warehouse and move it. And, and it becomes this like chained catastrophe where you have, you know, at a big distribution centers, hundreds of outbounds a day, hundreds of receipts potentially a day that you're trying to manage. And it's just untenable to do all of that with these simple heuristics that are kind of baked into the WMS as sites get more complex. So I, I won't go too in the weeds on all of the ins and outs and how it's constructed, but um, I did want to take a moment as, as Brian kind of talked about what are the challenges in actually um, and actually getting that data and doing it as a 3PL where you have this multi, you know, you have customers you have to consider, you have your data, who owns it, what needs to happen. Um, but also just call it like, what is the fundamental technology in place today and where, where does it struggle? Um, so uh, maybe we can, we can go a little bit forward and say, all right, we know where WMSs go, you know, run short. Um, 
what what's next, right? And, and I don't know, Ben, if you have anything um, on, on that note, uh, or, or are we okay to keep moving? Uh, no, absolutely. That's a fascinating subject here because it doesn't get uh, talked about enough, I think. Um, you know, the, the order profiles have gotten, um, I mean, just let's talk about, you know, the, the COVID impact in the last 18 months. So complex, right? Um, and, and that there are, you know, the customer expectations are soaring, like Brian was talking about. Um, that, that a lot of times, depending on what you're handling, you know, that, that we're getting more uh, more items in each order. Um, and, and, you know, it might be cheaper to send them in a single box. But if those customer expectations are that they're going to have it the next day, you might have to break it up. Um, and, and send it in two or three different packages. Um, and, and then, you know, you look at, at those kind of challenges and then, you know, we're here approaching, um, you know, peak season and, uh, and you know, there, were, there was you know, weather and, and overwhelmed networks uh, a couple years ago and there were a lot of, you know, hurt feelings uh, from, from customers at Christmas. So, you know, maybe now you have to change uh, those priorities as you move through the year. Uh, you know, you know it, it, it's one of those things that's, I guess, really hard because it's a moving target. Mm-hmm. So, so maybe, the, yeah, go ahead, Brian. No, go ahead. I was, I was going to say, you know, okay, we, we've talked about kind of the volatile, um, the, the, the kind of volatile uh, ecosystem we live in. It, let's, I mean, what's next, right? Theoretically, what do we do once we have the data? <clears throat> yeah, that's but once we actually have the data, because right now, again, we're pulling that potentially from different areas of, data collection, so it could be the whims, it could be the production manager, we're talking about communications with the, the, the shipping floor, or the warehouse, transportation, everything. Um, so knowing what we need, when we need it, um, and being able to make that plan, to your point, is, is going to be critical. Um, the planning teams, for example, at a lot of these warehouses that, that we're involved with with the United Facilities, um, are making changes three, four, five, six times a day to that same outbound plan or inbound plan based on the, the dynamic nature of the business at this point in time. Um, that makes some big changes and challenges when it comes to labor, because if you're trying to make labor decisions 24 plus hours out, um, and these changes that are happening 24 hours out or less, uh, you have to figure that out. So that pivot that you spoke of in the in the previous slide about having to focus what was intended to be inbound labor to outbound or vice versa is something that's very real. Um, in addition, being transportation challenges that exist right now, you also end up in a situation where you end up bunching those appointment times together. So you may not need the labor for the entire day. And so you don't want them to come in at the start of the shift. If you had the data in advance in some way to help make the decisions for you, you'd be able to decide to bring them in halfway through the shift. Also with the, the lot management aspect with the transportation, that has, becomes a bigger challenge. A lot of the carriers move to a far more uh, punitive process as far as the detention and demerage. Um, some of them have gone to an average versus just the standard as well as uh, reducing it to even 24, 48 hours on the lot before they're doing it, which also is compounded by the fact that you have an increase in the, the live inbound and outbound carriers who have some challenges showing up for appointment time because of challenges they see at other sites. And then as far as the inventory portion of this, um, zoning and slotting maintenance, um, cross-docking are all things that we need to look at if you, in the currently and then in the future because we have to try to streamline the process. I mean, we're not reinventing the wheel here. I mean, warehousing overall, the concepts haven't changed in quite some time. So how do we take what we're currently doing and come up with a more innovative strategy uh, within the constraints that we have with equipment, product, um, and those things outside of our control? Uh, yeah, and, and, and I'm really struck that that detention and demurrage issue that you mentioned, um, you know, is really causing a lot of pain uh, throughout the industry here. And, and it, it's one of those, um, you know, things that that's, it's hard to control because, um, you know, it, it, it's often uh, out of the control. It's often uh, not their fault, as it were. And, you know, we're seeing that now at, at the ports uh, as well when it looks like they're 
going to be some climbing fees there for trying to uh, reduce the uh, delays and the stacks up there. Uh, but you know, if you don't have the trucks to move them, then uh, you know, f folks can be backed up against the wall. Um, but it, it, well, isn't that what you're saying? The Sorry, the transportation portion as well. I mean, as you move more to a live carrier base versus an asset carrier um, strategy, you put more risk as far as tying up space within the operation. Um, you also have to become extremely flexible with that labor to be able to support um, the new appointment times that are changed or the drivers just showing up. Um, so absolutely, the, the, that part of it is, is definitely a struggle that I think everybody's facing. Um, and we have to be cognizant of. So anything that we can do to try to predict that, whether that becomes down to a reliability ask rating for the carriers, um, whether that is a labor management tool or technique, there's definitely something that some opportunity there for us. Really interesting. Awesome. So I guess, you know, we talk about getting data and, and, we talk about predicting all of these different things. How do you predict the labor need? How do you predict inventory? How do you predict what transportation is going to be doing and when it's going to be doing it, which is, I mean, really a hard problem. Um, foundationally, you know, a lot of folks say, all right, well, you know, we're going to build a forecast for this and a forecast for that and a forecast for, this. you know, forecasts don't help you in a warehouse. Um, they might help you on planning staffing six months from now or six weeks from now, but generally in, inside of a distribution center, you're, you know, you're 48 hours in go mode all the time. So everything, it, it's always about how do you execute on the work in front of you and how do you make sure that your, your fill rate to customers is high. And so um, really the, the core and, and kind of what, all bring, what brings all this together is this isn't about forecasting, right? This is about making better decisions faster. And so being prescriptive, I, I love using the term prescriptive because it means almost nothing to every engineer I talk to. Um, you say like, we're going to get into, you know, descriptive analytics and predictive analytics and prescriptive analytics. And, and by the time you get to prescriptive, like every single machine learning engineer or every data scientist is like, what the is that? Um, and the reason why I like using it is because like, if you're, you know, it, to most people, they kind of understand what it means at a very high level, which is like, I get prescribed medicine to make me feel better. I get prescribed analytics to make everything magically better. Um, when whatever my problem is in all the operations, they'll go away. And, and But I, you have to ground it, right? Which is, what does that actually mean from an engineering perspective and how does that drive value at a site? So all the problems Brian just mentioned is, can you use mathematics? And I'm avoiding machine learning and AI. And I'll save you guys my long 10 minute tirade about the misuse of AI in industry today. Um, and just say that really what we're talking about is advanced mathematics to make decisions more quickly. And you can use that to say, if I know what's happening and I know what's going to happen, I can make better decisions to avoid the negative outcomes that are going to happen. And so how tools like Auto Scheduler are doing that today is we're actually looking and saying, okay, we know that a shipment needs to leave at 1230 today. That is an appointment time for a drop load, so it needs to be loaded by then. That's when they're coming to pick it up. And I want to make sure my on-time and full rate is high because it's going to Walmart. So in order to get that done, I know that I need to start loading that trailer at 12 o'clock because there are 30 pallets. It's going to take me a minute per pallet. Simple math. Wait a second, though. I just realized that some of those pallets are full pallets. Some of those pallets are case pick pallets. That's a problem. I need to go and actually make sure that I can go get those full pallets to a staging area, and I can go pick those individual case pick pallets. Case pick is going to take much longer than just loading a full unit load onto a trailer. And so realistically, to account for all of those processes, I need to actually allocate that order and release that work at 9 o'clock so that I have two and a half hours to make sure that all of that inventory is in the right place for when it needs to get loaded. And then it's like, oh, shoot, I just realized that some of that case pick work that I need to release, I don't even have the inventory in a slot that's pickable. So I need to replenish that inventory. Shoot, I don't even have that inventory in the building, but I do have it sitting on an inbound waiting to be received. That means I need to bring in this inbound at this door at seven o'clock so that I can unload it to staging, replenish it to case pick, pick it, stage it, load it, and actually meet that load ready date and time or customer appointment time at 1230. 
And when we talk about prescriptive, you know, that is a single workflow, the narrative of one truck through a distribution center. And the reality is you're dealing with dozens to hundreds of those a day with all sorts of other problems that are going to occur. And so you really need a prescriptive mathematics engine to understand how does all of this work happen in tandem and what are the bottlenecks I'm going to run into? Is it going to be labor? Is it going to be staging space? And what can I do to navigate around them so I get as much done as possible? So and you, I think you, you said something, sorry, Keith, to jump in, but you said ahead. something really interesting um, <laughs> about making decisions more quickly, uh, because, you know, to, to your point about um, what, what, what does predictive mean, I, I'm sure that could mean something, you know, different to every person you talk to. It's a little bit like what does real time data mean, right? Um, it, 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 it depends on who you're talking to and, and, and what the mode of transportation is. And, you know, airplanes, you know, move a lot faster than uh, trucks and move faster than ships. Um, but, you know, even if you can't look farther into the future and extend that prediction, if you can make decisions more quickly, um, then you can have the same effect, right? It, 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 it's sort of, uh, if, if you, it's like forecasting weather, even if you can't tell farther away that that storm's coming, if you can get out of the way faster, uh, you know, that, then you can deal with it uh, in just the same benefit. That's exactly uh, it. And to piggyback on that, that becomes really critical now with all the challenges that we spoke about before, because we have to look at that load leveling. Um, even if that's not something that's based in the, the customer's process, we have to internally look at that to be able to meet those demands and the variation. So that having that predictive aspect of it is crucial. Cool. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I was, I was trying to sing the children's mm -hmm. song earlier pre-call, but um, you know, everything's connected, right? You can't make a decision in a silo in a distribution center. All of these processes need to flow in sequence. And so you can't just optimize them one at a time because you'll end up with something just as broken as what we're doing today or, or what a lot of sites are doing today on manually planning them. Gotcha. Uh, great. This is, these are some really helpful uh, definitions and, and some context to, and to understand uh, sort of what the goal is here. but. Uh, you know, how, how do we get there? Uh, and I think it's time to move into the part of the discussion today where we can talk about roadmaps and, uh, and see if we can make some progress toward that horizon. Yeah, so to maybe to start with that, um, I'm gonna share a narrative I stole from another industry, uh, which is, you know, everybody talks about dark warehousing, everything's going dark. And, and so I use the expression is the future of the uh, or the warehouse of the future is a man and a dog. And then people generally ask, oh, well, what's the what's the man for? Well, the man's there to feed the dog. Well, what's the dog for? Well, the dog's there to make sure the man doesn't touch anything. And you, you kind of look at that and you're like, well, yeah, that's exactly what, you know, anytime you, you talk to a, a VP of logistics and you talk about all the distribution centers they own, where are they going to be in 20 years? And that's the story you get. We're going to have dark distribution centers. We're going to have this fantastic, you know, split level system that's able to deliver to stores and direct to consumers. And it's all going to be dark and it's all perfect. And then I go to that customer. I'm like, hey, that's awesome. I'm a huge fan. Let's make it happen. Tell you what we're going to do. We're going to put auto scheduler in and we are going to uh, start to we're going to start really small. We're just going to allocate shipments automatically. So instead of having a planner click the button in the warehouse management system, we're just going to automatically do it in auto scheduler so the work gets dropped into the queue in the right order. And everybody then immediately says, nope, can't do that. Like, I don't want, I, people do allocation. There's too many things. You can't automate it. I'm like, all right, well, then how are you going to get to manual? Or like, how are you going to get to a dark warehouse if you can't even do this simple thing or aren't willing to do it? And, and so there's actually a lot of change management required to get there. And so, Brian, I know you, you, your team has been dealing with that, I think, um, more, more than a lot of folks. So I don't know if it might be useful for you to talk about, like, what's the first step in starting to get to dark planning? Well, I mean, one is obviously finding someone who can provide that solution for you because the capabilities of many 3PLs in the IT space to, to develop this um, isn't necessarily where the their bread and butter is. It's not their their wheelhouse. So, so finding that, but then also you need to have something that's going to be easy to use, um, have a, a interface that is pretty simple, um, something as simple as you could do on an app on your phone, uh, and then getting something that's reliable. So you need to start small, um, do the testing to make sure that it is sustainable and understood. 
um, to build that confidence because there's a lot of skepticism out there. We've all had, um, you know, the the account hacks and all of these other things that exist in the world um, that make people a little leery when there's unknown technology that has no reviews from their peers. So being able to do that is, is crucial. Um, and then when you get the buy-in, then it'll move smooth, smoothly. Like the planning team that we're dealing with right now with Auto Scheduler, um, they're looking at it as a way to help reduce the time that it takes. Um, it's reducing the number of clicks um, as we move forward into the next steps of it that it takes to actually execute on the plan um, and also trigger the fact that when one of those changes that you spoke of uh, takes place and when there has to be a change in direction. So getting them to understand the process and making people understand how that is going to make their job easier and not more complex um, and, and get over that skepticism is critical. Yeah, that's interesting because uh, you know if if you read you know the press releases, um, yeah, there's an there's a, a, a groundswell, you know, rising tide of of, of data and and um, you know high tech solutions for some of these things that that that's coming uh, you know belatedly into the logistics sector. But um, to, you know, to your point about you know what is the wheelhouse um, of a lot of these actual operators, um, and and there are an awful lot uh, of of DCs out there that are really good at making it work with a really small amount of technology in the building uh, still, right? Absolutely. I mean, you, most of the employees and in, in, I would say in a, a large percentage of, of distribution centers, I mean, they've got more update technology in many cases on that smartphone that they're using at break than what they're doing to operate the, the flow of the warehousing. And it's definitely an opportunity that's out there for the warehousing industry to start looking at that. And I understand the challenges on the ROI, um, but with the labor challenges that we spoke of earlier, I think that there's definitely an opportunity to offset some of that if you look at a, a longer game versus the, the short ROI that most companies look for. Yeah. So I guess getting kind of into that ROI piece and Brian, you just kind of talked about like, how do you get the t technology introduced and how do you build that trust, right? And so, so kind of the workflow that you can see on the screen is, you know, the first thing you do is you just put it in place and you let them use it as they want. It is a tool to make their life easier, to take a lot of the decision making they would have to make and just present them. Here is the decision we would make for you. Do you agree? Yes or no. And do you want to actually enact those changes? And after, after you know, unfortunately, it takes time, you can start to build that confidence. And it's really a change management thing more so than a technology thing. Um, and the, the next step then is how do you actually take that and start to automate pieces of it? And so um, we'll, we'll talk about like a semi-automated workflow, which is... And the reality is, inside of a warehouse management system, making change, and, and there are three key changes I, I want to call out, three key changes that you, you really make inside of a WMS. You have um, allocation, you have release of work, and you have uh, the work queue management, right? And, and so of those three things, and I, I use the term allocation broadly, because we're talking about inventory allocation to shipment, shipments, you know, I... I throw cross stock under there, I throw cuts management under there, I throw a lot of different things under there. But how do you start to automate those processes? Like, you know, what trailer needs to be in what door at what time? When are you releasing work? What are you cross stocking? What are you cutting? How do you make those decisions? And so you actually, inside of these tools, you can actually just say, here's a button of all the recommendations we would make. And instead of you looking at them and deciding which ones you want to implement, just click the button. Just say, yep, that looks good, that looks good, that looks good, that looks good, that looks good. And you can go and direct inject all of this stuff into the warehouse management system. And that can kind of be a behind the scenes process, as Brian mentioned, save you a lot of clicks and, and really reduce the overall friction of introducing the technology because it's still human controlled. Even though it is algorithmically recommended, you move to this human controlled, much easier to implement, much easier to actually move towards dark. And then eventually, when, once that comfort level is built, you swap. So eventually, you know, first you have everything a person needs to click yes, 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 yes. And after a few months, you say, well, wait a second, you're just clicking yes on everything. How about we swap? And you just uncheck the ones you don't want to happen, at which point you're dark. All of these processes, you're, you're talking about, can you dynamically allocate inventory? Can you dynamically release work to the floor? Can you actually use intelligent tasking to understand 
what work needed to be done based on what the planning system said, what work is being done, where are we behind, where are we ahead, how many people should be focused on each task at a, you know, at, at a certain level, and how do we respect where people are in their proximity to chain tasks together, do a better job of interleaving, and at the end of the day, get as much capacity as you could out of every single person working in that facility, particularly because of the labor shortage, Brian, that you mentioned earlier. So, so that's kind of what we do at most sites. And we're talking like a practical roadmap. Step one, run in, run in parallel. Let people learn it. Let people trust it. Step two, start to let them directly make decisions in the WMS so you're reducing that friction. There are a lot less clicks, a lot less processes. Um, some of the like latest Blue Yonder WMS, uh, has they built out a really good suite of APIs that make it a lot easier to do this. Um, and then step three, finally go dark which this is not a dark warehouse, but it is a dark planning process. And a dark planning process will mitigate a huge amount of friction that you see in site. I, uh, I was at a customer uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, their comment was, we drive from Chicago to New York every day and wasted miles on a forklift. It was a big site. It was like 1.2 million square feet. Um, but that's a lot of miles. That's a lot of wasted productivity. And that's solely because in, inside of a WMS, it doesn't do a good job of of understanding who is where, managing the work queue in a dynamic way so that you can assign the best task to the right person all the time. And that's what this sort of dark planning ecosystem is able to provide, even if you don't spend a single cent on hardware upgrades, which you should also do, but that's a different story for a different time. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it, it, that's so interesting, and, and I mean, and like you said, this is dark planning. This is not a dark uh, building. I, I think that we're, we're talking about here. Um, but I mean, you know, folks get scared, right? Um, and and you know, it, 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 in a physical sense, um, it, if if the building is dark, you know, some stuff happens. And uh, you know, it, if if you're moving crates of um, you know ragu tomato sauce, if if, if you, you know you put it down too heavily, uh, you know, all of a sudden you got marinara all over the, your, uh, your your nice concrete warehouse floor and then your uh, your, your lift trucks are skidding as they take that corner um are, are there you know similar things that happen in a dark process i mean it, maybe stuff is also going to happen in that situation uh but but people can step in uh and, and when needed yeah there absolutely are and, and you know brian sees this every day with with some of the work that we we do inside of auto schedule but there are things that a dark planning process can't fix and that's okay right um, the, the thing is, it needs to call them out ahead of time. So, for mm -hmm. example, you know, you are uh, even something as simple as like, hey, you're loading this trailer and this trailer is going to be overweight uh, or overweight. Like, that's a problem. We can't tell you put less on that trailer because it means us making cuts that we don't really have the justification to make. But it does at least tell you, hey, planner, do something about this. Mm -hmm. Or even though cuts had already been done maybe upstream by SAP or the inventory planning solution, we still know that you're going to be 42 cases short on this particular shipment. There is a receipt coming in an hour later that you could use to cross stock that inventory. However, we can't change your appointment times because we know that you, you set those with the carrier, but you, Mr. Planner, could call somebody about it. And so like being able to take the information and say, if there are decisions you can't make, actually bubble that up so that people can take action more quickly. I don't know, Brian, if you have anything to add on that. No, I, I agree. I mean, there, there's so many different uh, paths that can, can happen on the way from end to end when that planning process and, and any one of those deviations can start a chain reaction and having that visibility to it, um, you know, to your point of you're going to be short something. I mean, the, the effort that it takes to, to get that order put together to go out um, to find out that it's going to be overweight. Obviously, there's some opportunities upstream um, to catch up, but or the contrary side of that of being short the product. Again, if you communicate to to a customer well in advance on some of those things, you may have an opportunity to move that labor out to two or three days later when that product will be in there and uh, help their fill rate get them the product they need without tying up space and labor before it's really necessary. Yes. Sorry, go ahead, Ben. Uh, no, great, great. That that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it, it, at the point, there are a lot of moving uh, parts to keep track of here. That it, it, it's uh, it's just a big symphony. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so every site is unique. 
and there are multifunctions. And, and I know that we spoke earlier of, of operations and silos, and, and unfortunately, that's still that's something that goes on. I mean, you do look at a inbound receiving process and outbound receiving process. Um, but looking at workflows that, that can be leveraged to optimize that aspect of it, um, when should you bring a trailer in, make sure that it's not tying up inbound, outbound bays longer than it needs to, when should you start staging it, um, what is that trigger point for an order versus just being able to, to Keith's point earlier, based on appointment time and with no concern about how long it will actually sit there on the, on the dock waiting to be loaded. Um, those are all things that will be great when you have an opportunity with a, with a product like Auto Schedule to do that. That dark planning aspect of it will be something that we're extremely excited about uh, going forward with because one of the things that we're focused on quite a bit right now is, is cross-docking meeting certain goals and KPIs and that's something we've done manually for years. Um, being able to do that in a, in a format that potentially is going to allow us three times what we're able to do manually um, from what we anticipate is, is definitely a great opportunity. Um, these type of things are, are what's going to be critical in the warehousing industry to meet those customer demands as the customer demands evolve and change and, and you look at the challenges that they face. I know that, that most manufacturers are really looking at cost saving opportunities to try to make make some profitability with everything with the increase in transportation costs and labor costs that they're facing. So any way that we can look to reduce labor um, and the overall cost at the warehousing level will be critical. Yeah, and, and just to, to add a little bit on that, right? And, and you know, you see this across all the sites that you operate, but every site's kind of unique. Um, yes. There are Absolutely. so many weird processes, I wish I had a better term for it, that I see at different sites like, Oh, when I'm dealing with customer X, I have to load it out of this door and I have to slap this sticker on it or else they're going to reject it. It's like, oh, OK, well, we'll find a way to account for that. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, being able to do that, you know, one of the things we talk about, right, there's like the descriptive, predictive, prescriptive, IBM level, high level. Here's what you need to know. And, and it like it has to apply to you, right? I have to be able to model that exact, use this door, make sure that you're you know, slapping a sticker on it. And so doing this in a way that's flexible, scalable, um, and can easily be kind of deployed at all of these different unique sites is a big challenge, but also something that is really needed in the industry. And, and so um, I, I will say, don't sacrifice the uniqueness of your site for, and this is for anybody who's listening in that is, uh, runs uh, distribution centers, like don't sacrifice the uniqueness of your site so that you can get a buzzword implemented. Like it needs to match your process, be something your team is comfortable with um, and, and grow that way. It's, it's uh, unfortunately the reality is you got to deliver to your customers and yeah, we need to do it with um, potentially more capacity per headcount and, and higher levels of efficiency. But you know, we have to meet the demands of our customers, whether you're in Brian's shoes and, and you know, as a, a awesome 3PL or even as a, a shipper that runs some of their own distribution centers. So worth calling out um, as far as just, you know, some, some final thoughts on how do you actually take this and make it practical? And it's make sure it fits your site, um, but absolutely worth exploring, says, says the guy who, you know, builds the software. <laughs> No, uh, I agree completely. I mean, it is really critical with the variations, customer to customer, um, and and the changes that we're seeing in that becoming even more um, labor intensive in some of the ask. There is so much variation that having something that can can understand those variations and do it. I mean, it's one of the things I mentioned earlier that in some of the more tech spaces, um, as far as automation. You're, there isn't too many things that can look at all those variations and manage it. So finding something like auto scheduler that will be able to do that for us will be critical and uh, extremely exciting for the employees once we get it fully up implemented. Cool. Yeah. So that's Great. it for me. Um, ben, any, any closing thoughts you want to make sure we hit on? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that was a, a really good point about, um, you know, that not, not just uh, getting that buzzword in there to, uh, to, to, you know, check that box uh, for how your operation's going, but you really have to read the KPIs uh, that, that matter. Um, and, and, you know, with an eye on the clock, we want to, you know, respect our viewers here with the audience. So we're going to, I think, move on to the Q&A here. Um, and for those who are listening in, there's still time to get your questions to us. Um, and b before I do that, I'd like to mention uh, that there are some extra resources available. You can find additional information in the resources tab on your console. Uh, but let's get to those questions and we'll see what's in the, uh, in the queue here. Uh, looks like we have a couple. Let's see, looking at the numbers here. Here's a question that came in. How do automated systems and robotics play into this equation? Uh, Brian, Keith, uh, what, when do you want to start with that? Brian, you want to start and I'll, I'll finish? <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, obviously it's something that we're, we're looking at it from the, the 3PL level, but how do they fit in? I mean, you have to use the, that, that scaled approach um, as well, but it, the, the ROI part of it, as we spoke of it, it becomes critical and it's something that we've struggled with um, justifying the, that reduction. How do they fit in that space? I mean, I think you need to end up with something that can communicate with that, with those type of planning aspects. and. And what we've seen from what we've done the research on within the United facilities is we just haven't seen too many things right now that bridge that gap that exists from just adding that automation or robotics, which is another data point or two that, that is going to operate slightly different than the warehouse management software and the production management and the transportation management. But Keith can probably speak more to it from the auto scheduler approach to it. Yeah, it, I mean, it's like we all know that's where it's going, right? It's is there return on investment today? It depends, right? A really quick story about automation is we, we worked at a site that implemented AGVs, um, and they're like, yeah, we're going to save so much headcount. And, and they realized, well, the AGVs drive actually a lot slower than forklifts. It's a really big site, and they couldn't go backwards when they started. So if they missed a, a pickup, it was a you know round the whole aisle, um, which is going to make things go a little bit longer. And, and so – you know, there are all sorts of challenges in introducing things like AGVs or, you know, one of the more common ones in, in consumer goods or like ASRS systems. And just because those challenges exist doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It's just you should recognize it's not all going to be roses and daisies up front. And then the other problem is those systems have fringe boundaries that need to interact with other systems. Until you're completely dark, there's a person somewhere, right? And so even if you are using an ASRS, um, for inventory storage, that needs to come out and that's gonna come out to a spur. And at that spur, you, you know, a person needs to be ready to pick it up and take it to staging. And then from staging, a person is probably responsible for picking it up and taking it to loading, or it might go straight from spur to loading because you can do that with a forklift and you don't need a reach truck. But the, I mean, the call out being, you have to orchestrate, when do I trigger that move in the ASRS? When does it show up at that spur? You know, that spur is effectively the same as a dock inside of a, you know, an, an ASRS. And so being able to actually orchestrate how robotics fit into the bigger picture, and that's really, if you take anything away from this narrative, it's that there's a bigger picture that needs to be optimized. Robotic systems are just actors that enable you to do a task. And that task in an ASRS case is retrieval and put away. And so great, I don't need people for that, but I still need to make sure that they're orchestrated with all the other tasks that need to be respected in that sequence of you know, delivering to a customer on time and full. Um, I won't go, I think that's a good enough example given time, um, but yep. I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, no, that, that, that's great. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll try to get, we have a couple more questions here, so we'll, we'll try to get them all in. Um, the, the second one that we have here, uh, is a comment that we haven't really spoken much about AI, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. Uh, why is that? Uh, Keith, I think you, you had indicated before that you uh, had some opinions there. Yeah, um, <laughs> we talked about we talked about the IBM isms, um, you know, being predictive, being uh, prescriptive. But the, the reality is, um, machine learning and AI has been completely misused, and uh, I, I'm trying not to swear, but it, it's been. Um, very misused by marketing teams in just about every space. And so it's, uh, you know, I have, I have multiple, you know, papers and machine learning patents to my name. So, it, you know, I, I'd like to qualify as kind of an expert in the space or at least semi expert. Um, and what, what we find is really when you're talking about distribution centers, 
the actual technologies of machine learning and AI are um, so, sometimes a real challenge to get implemented. And really, um, I, I would more broadly say, I, I mentioned earlier, use the term mathematics, don't use AI or machine learning, because those actually, by the time you get to the foundational algorithms, those mean certain things. Um, and, and so really, we're talking about using the broad field of mathematics to help automate, um, to, to help predict and then automate decision making. Um, and, and that doesn't necessarily mean it is machine learning or you know, AI is so ethereal, it means almost everything to everybody. Right. Uh, but I, I, again, I could go on my soapbox about the use of machine learning in industry, um, at least in marketing terms for industry. And it, it's been so misused that um, I actually avoid talking about it. Talk about a solution, talk about the value you're providing Math, machine learning, AI, that is all just a means to an end. There will be many more. There have been many in history. Gotcha. <laughs> so did, you don't have too many opinions. But yeah, you don't have too many Off opinions. Off my soapbox. <laughs> That's great. Um, all right, two, two more that we'll get to uh, and then wrap it up here. Um, so number three we got is, what is best for an in-house team to focus on versus outsourcing to a 3PL like UFI or a software vendor like Autoscheduler. Brian, you want to take that one? Sure. I mean, from my perspective, that would be, I mean, I've been um, in organizations previously that, that are in that situation, and you really have to look at what capabilities you have and what are the needs and what, a, what levers can you pull to make some improvement um, to get there. Uh, I don't know what the resources are of, of that individual location to know can they actually do the level of improvement necessary to be successful without some outside resources there's possible there's some organizations that are set up that way um typically my experience has been is that's not how they are are typically structured based on the fact that that's not been their wheelhouse so mm -hmm. um i think that looking at what you're capable of making changes in internally to work toward this um and, and maybe it's a hybrid solution. Maybe it's not a full um, 3PL involvement. There are steps within that aspect of it as well. Um, as, and I'm sure there are also some IT, external IT resources that may be able to support things without having to technically go completely to a full um, dark thought process like auto schedulers. Um, Keith, what is your perspective on this? Yeah, I, I agree completely. Is play like play to your strengths. I tell that to everybody, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there, you know, I, I con consumer goods companies is kind of the the majority of the folks that I'm going to be working with and, and have been working with. Where they they are the ones who have to decide: do they want to build software in house? Do they want to outsource it? Do they want to hire up a staff and go purchase or lease distribution centers and actually manage those themselves, or do they want to go with companies like United Facilities? And and what it comes down to is do what you're good at and uh, have the humility to recognize what you're not good at. And that's really hard. I, I understand I can say that and people will, you know, they'll nod. But at the end of the day, like when you're making decisions, it's something you need to think about. And most organizations really struggle with that is, well, we can hire up people and we'll solve this problem. But if you're a consumer goods company and you don't have a track record in building software, whereas there are a lot of organizations that do, I mean, why would you start now? It's a big challenge. Now right. there are companies I've seen that have been successful at it. So I don't, you know, I don't mean that to throw stones. There are absolutely shippers out there that are building up fantastic IT teams that are pretty much software development teams, and they're building some of their own internal tooling, and that's stellar. If you have the team and you can do it, and you think it'll be the long-term play, do it. But also recognize you're going to have to support it for the next decade, twenty yeah. years. Right. Possibly. I like that. I like that. Um, um, all right, and and Keith, I want to jump in because we're we're uh, we're bringing this in sorry. on time here, um, and and it looks like um, Brian, the last one might be for you. If you can just give me a minute on this one, um, can you provide some examples of how three PLs like UFI make warehouses more prescriptive? Just just a minute or so there. Sure, I think that the the critical critical aspect, whether it's the auto schedule or or some of the the things that have been done in the past, is truly understanding that understanding the customer's business and being able to anticipate what they need before they do to that point that Keith just made about playing to their strong suits. Most of these organizations, um, what we're doing for them, either auto schedule or United facilities is not their strong suit. So being able to understand that. And unfortunately that is something that has to be developed um, 
either intrinsically as an individual or looking for, for process improvement opportunities with auto scheduler and that type of thing. So being able to do that, it will be critical, I think, for all three PLs, and it's something that uh, I'm excited to, to move forward with auto scheduler as a partner on. Awesome. That sounds like some good advice for everybody. Uh, so great. We'd like to thank all of our viewers here for being with us today and, uh, and being part of the conversation. Uh, shortly after this live event, we will send everybody who registered an email reminder to access this presentation on demand so you can view it once more or share it with a colleague. Thanks again to our presenters, Keith and Brian, for a really informative session. Uh, again, we encourage you to find more information about our topics today by going to that resources tab. And thank you for sharing your time today. We know your time is valuable, and we hope that you walked away with some good ideas to help you better manage your supply chains. For all of us at DC Velocity, I'm Ben Ames. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.